Y nuestro siguiente ponente eh, viene de Reyo Emilia, sitio espectacular, por cierto, y no hay que presentar mucho porque simplemente el título de la ponencia, entrando en la zona oscura, la pedagogía de las relaciones, creo que lo dice todo para que veamos qué nos quiere contar eh, María Valentín, por favor. Muchas gracias, Daniel. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's um, what a wonderful conference. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. And um, the thing about being after lunch is it's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> You've all had your lunch. You had a glass of wine. I saw you. <laughs> I didn't. I'll have one later. <laughs> um, so. My challenge, I suppose, is to keep you interested, to keep that curiosity going, so you have that motivation we heard all about earlier. Hmm? Um, I'm here to talk about something very simple, I think, in many ways, um, that I hope might push your thinking a little bit. Hmm? Um, and I'm here uh, working in the context of my role with the group of inspired schools that uh, we are very lucky to have San Patrizio in our family. And I work uh, with very young children. Um, my role is uh, I am responsible for the learning of children between the age of zero <laughs> and six, okay? So um, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, try to think very carefully about that age group, about those children. Hmm? Um, when I, I met Sonsoles the very first time in Reggio Emilia uh, in January, and it was a very, very special day. I had a very special time with Sonsoles and some of the school leaders from San Patrizio. And at the end of that day, after some wonderful conversation, Sonsoles asked me, do you think you could come and talk at ENAP? And I'm really sorry, I didn't know what ENAP was. <laughs> uh, now I do, and it's wonderful. Um, and so, of course, it sounded so interesting, and I immediately I said, I would love to come. And then she said, oh, well, uh, the theme is assessment. And I thought, ooh, assessment. I didn't expect that. So then I had to kind of dive deep down into my courage, you know, and think, okay, assessment. Um, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me working with very, very small human beings? <laughs> and I think that what I'd like to share with you today is that Really, ultimately, uh, assessing, evaluating very young children is an act of love. Hmm? It's uh, an act in which we have to open our hearts and our minds to everything that young children can do. And not only everything they can already do, but everything they could do, because it's about their potential as well. Hmm? Um, so, this is where I live. <laughs> I live in a little town in Italy called Reggio Emilia. Hmm? Um, Reggio Emilia, I think some of you have heard of. Hmm? Have you ever been? Has anyone been to Reggio Emilia? Great, fantastic. Um, it's just a, a little northern Italian industrial town. Uh, we have about 150,000 people. Hmm? It's not a tourist town. It's very authentic, normal Italian life. Hmm? And uh, I think it connects a lot with life in Toledo, actually. <laughs> There's a lot of connections, and we're going to talk about connections. Hmm? Um, but Reggio Emilia is known all over the world uh, for a very special approach 
to learning, uh, specifically in the early childhood. Hmm? And um, just for those who don't know, I, I think it's important to give you a little bit of background hmm? uh, to why this happened. And uh, this all goes right back to the end of the Second World War, and um, this part of the world had been very hardly hit by the war. By the war. And uh, when you come to the end of something like that, and uh, you have to start again, uh, you have to create something that gives hope. So there was a group of young families, young parents, and uh, outside of town, and they they wanted to create something new, something better, something to live for, something that would create a new society. Hmm? They had some resources. They had a couple of tanks that the Germans had left over when they left. <laughs> some horses. Excuse me, I'm going to take some water. <laughs> uh. Thanks. So they had um, some horses, a couple of tanks. They had some rubble and bricks, and they had a little bit of money. And they got together in the way that Italians do and uh, had a big discussion, because we like to discuss. And uh, there was a bit of a disagreement. Hmm? But we like that in Italy. We like to have disagreements and discuss. Um, so the disagreement was this way. It was the fathers, the men in the town, felt that culture was important, so they wanted to build a cinema. The woman in the town wanted to build a school. So this is how it began. And uh, a very young uh, teacher, pedagogista, um, psychologist called Loris Malaguzzi, he was very young, he was in his 20s, he heard about this and he got on his bicycle and he cycled out of town into the countryside where they were. And that in itself was very important. That in itself was an act of freedom because up until all through the war, the bicycle was banned. The bicycle was banned because with the bicycle, you can spread knowledge. Mm. They didn't have the internet. <laughs> they had bicycles. And so it was banned um, by the fascists. And, and so he got on his bike and he went all the way out into the village and he found this group of people. And he said, I heard about what you're doing. I want to know what you're doing. And they said, we want to build a school. And he says, I'm a teacher. And they said, we need you. Hmm? And that's, that's how everything began. It began through community. And Laura spoke so well this morning about community. And, and, and you need community to build a school and to build understanding and learning. Hmm? So this is how this has grown over the years. And we now have almost 80 schools, preschools, in the town and the surrounding area. And of those, um, more than 40 are run by the local authorities, and they work in the way that I'm going to try to share a little bit of it with you uh, this afternoon. Mm. Um, but the word community is so, so important. Um, and more than anything, it's the word relationship. What we call this way of working, and it's not so much a way of working, to be honest. What we're talking about is a way of being with children. Hmm? And this way of being with children is called the pedagogy of relationships. Hmm? Um, can you see? Yeah. So um, now let's just look at the photograph. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think, you know, sometimes the photographs are the best thing to, to look at more than the words. And I think here we have that curiosity to understand that we've heard so much about already. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have to today try to connect with here is that 
When you have been on this planet for 18 months or two years, the curiosity that you have is so much more than any of us can imagine. Hmm? We've forgotten, unfortunately. Huh? We try to keep it going. Um, but they, they have a curiosity which fuels that motivation. Hmm? Um, and I think what we seek to do is to help those children have that kind of motivation that we, we would call intrinsic motivation, you know? The desire, the desire to understand through my curiosity. Uh, and children are experts at this. Young, young children are experts at being curious and most of all, at observing. Hmm? They are the most expert observers on the planet. <laughs> hmm? Which is a really terrifying thing to think about when you're a teacher because they watch every single thing you do. Hmm? And they don't really do what you say, do they? <laughs> they do what you do. So, um, they are learning from each other and through each other. Hmm? So this is a way of working which is social constructivist. Hmm? Uh, this is taking us right to the heart of uh, the work of uh, Vygotsky. Hmm? It's telling us, I learn through you but I also learn through my environment, through everything that is around me. Hmm? Um, I learn not just from other children, I learn from adults, and I learn from the animals, the plants, the trees, everything, everything that is around me is new. I'm, I've just arrived. <laughs> everything is new. And so, what the children are doing is inquiring. Hmm? So many programs and curricula that are out there that use that word inquiry and yet don't give children the time to go so deeply into their research. Hmm? Um, so this way of working is a, a research inquiry way of working with the children. Hmm? Um, you're not born knowing who you are. I don't think we think about that too much. But you do not come into this world knowing who you are. Hmm? We have to construct our identity. And we construct our identity all the way through life. And anyone who gets to my age knows that sometimes you look back and think, wow, I hardly recognize myself <laughs> when I look back. Um, but these young children are constructing their identity through the experiences that they have every day. And they're not doing that alone. They are co-constructing their own identity. And that is the one major aim that we have. They are trying to co-construct their identity so that they essentially can understand what it means to be human. And it's my belief, honestly, that Really, if you want to bring education down to one sentence, it's that. It's trying to help support someone to finally understand what does it mean to be human and what is their place in this world. So this puts a huge emphasis then on intersubjectivity. We speak a lot about subjectivity, don't we? Hmm? Um, but this puts a big emphasis on the intersubjectivity. People speak to me from all over the, the world about Reggio and they say, I really love it because it's such a child-centered approach. And I always stop and think about that and I think, no, it's not. Because it doesn't isolate the child. Hmm? It values each child but it is a group-centered approach. Because we do not put so much emphasis on independence, but on interdependence. It's all about the relationship that we build between each other. Hmm? So I think 
The word relationship is the first word that we really have to keep close. Um, now, obviously, I'm going to be looking at how they evaluate children, but I think to do that, what we have to do is try to just take a little time and understand um, what are the pillars of this, this approach. Hmm? Um, and uh, how is it that they manage to do what they, what they do? So at the heart of everything then is this. Everything else that we do comes from this. It comes from how we see children. And how you see children is a choice that you make. Hmm? And it's not a choice you make once. It's a choice you make every day in the classroom as a teacher or every day at home as a parent. It's a choice you make in every moment in that day with the children. And it's a choice that will affect the expectations that you will have of that child. And it's a choice that will affect the expectations you will have for him and of him. Hmm? And it's a choice that will ultimately affect the kind of school that you create for him. And you don't create a school once, do you? You create your school every day you walk into it. Every day you think about what am I going to offer these children today. Every time you prepare your classroom for those children, you think about how you're considering how you see them. You may not be aware you're doing it, but you are. Hmm? Um, and how do we see them? Well, in Reggio Emilia, we've chosen to see that child as being very rich, rich in potential, curious, competent, hmm? but most of all, highly relational. We, we, we know that, we see that. We learn through each other. So most of all, we see these children as being fundamentally connected to the other, connected to other children, connected to the adults who are working with them. And that's something you need to keep with you as we walk through this together, because it affects all the other choices that we make for them, okay? Mm. Now, I used earlier on the word research, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, um, David, where is David? Is he here still? No? Um, he spoke a lot this morning um, about play and the importance of play. And this is fundamental to how young children learn. You know that. I don't need to tell you that. Um, And in Reggio Emilia, of course, we are giving children so many different ways to... Um, so could I ask one favor? I have to ask you not to take photographs of the slides with the, photo with the children, um, because I'm, I, I don't have authority from Reggio to share them. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, if there's just ones without photographs, please do, but um, it's just to protect the image of the child. Okay. Thanks. So. The children, through their natural curiosity, their playfulness, their inquisitiveness, um, their desire to understand, their desire to connect, um, we are offering them many different ways of expressing themselves hmm? so that they can express everything that they have here. Hmm? We believe that children are constantly, through their play and through their discovery and through their curios curiosity, are constantly building theory. 
mm, and understanding. If you are an inquirer, if you are a researcher, if you are inquisitive, you are constantly creating questions in your mind. You know that. Mm? If you are 18 months old, if you are two years old, if you are four years old, you may not yet have the verbal language to express all the thinking that you have in your mind. Mm. Um, and so we have to give those children as many opportunities as possible to share that thinking, to share that very complex thinking that we know that they have in as many ways as possible. We have to give them ways to make the thinking visible, that is non-verbal. Mm. And in Reggio Emilia, um, Maraguzzi, who is the founder, um, he created the metaphor of the hundred languages of children. The hundred languages is a metaphor of all those many different ways children have of expressing their thinking, their thoughts, their feelings, their theories. Hmm? Um, and so we are offering them many, many different aesthetic possibilities to make that connection. Hmm? Um, because through these languages, children are able to inquire in that subjective, intersubjective way by going down deeply into a concept from many different perspectives. Mm? And in that way, they are making those connections between one concept and another concept, and they're building a theory. And they're also able to show us what they may not be able to tell us. When you um, are inquiring, and someone asks an interesting research-based, inquiry-based question, the answer is going to be complex. The answer is not going to be yes or no. Hmm? Um, what we're asking someone to do is to have higher order thinking. And higher order thinking is hard as an adult. So when you are three years old, or two years old, or four, it becomes very complex. So we have to give them channels through which they can express that and share it. Because what use is thinking if you do not share it? Hmm? And within all of this, of course, the environment becomes extremely, extremely important. Uh, the richness of the environment will affect the richness of the learning that takes place. What you will be beginning to understand here is we do not have a learning that is based on something on a piece of paper. We do not have a learning which you can take and put in a file. Hmm? We're beginning to build up a picture of a kind of learning that is interactive um, and is uh, group-based also, is intersubjective. Uh, I'm learning through the other. So, can I even take ownership of that learning? Is it even useful for me to take ownership of that learning if we constructed it together? Now, when you think about all that, try to imagine what kind of assessment <laughs> procedure might be useful. Hmm? Going right back to that story then, at the beginning um, of Malaguzzi and his bicycle, and that community at the very beginning, building that school, that has had a direct impact on the, la the, ne the 60 years that have followed. And these schools remain very much schools of the community. Mm? And families participate in the life of the school, and families not only take part in the school, but feel they are a part of the school, and that's a very, very different thing. Hmm? To feel that the school belongs to you too. And it's not a case of just taking part in something sociable. This is about taking part in something in terms of building a culture of learning together. The child, the teacher, 
the parent. Hmm? And in this way, we go back to that idea of intersubjectivity because all three of these people bring a different perspective to the table. Hmm? All three of these people have a right to understand what is happening, the learning that is taking place. So what kind of assessment or evaluation will give value to the role that the parent has in the child's learning? Hmm? I don't know many assessment procedures that take that into consideration. So that's what we're going to have a look at. Eh? Well, in Reggio, if I can just snip back a bit. Sorry, okay. In Reggio Emilia, our whole assessment and um, evaluation process is here. Progettazione and documentation. And I don't translate that because you can't translate it, but you might have a similar word in Spanish. Hmm? Um, so, progettazione, um, is not exactly planning, okay? Uh, it's something very different from planning, and we'll talk about that in a little while. But progettazione, if I have to translate it, I would be trying to say something like um, planning by design. Hmm? Possibility thinking. Uh, so, the reason I, I'm talking about planning when we're supposed to be talking about evaluation is that you cannot separate them. Hmm? They cannot be separated. And this is one of the things about Reggio Emilia that uh, it changes the whole process. It is no longer a linear process at all. Hmm? So let's just jump back again. Hmm. So, our process of progettazione and documentation, documentazione, um, is what we call in English pedagogical documentation. Those of you who have been to Reggio Media will remember what this looks like, hmm? and some of you might have seen it elsewhere. So, people focus very much on the final product, which is a very beautiful panel, uh, which shows learning process. But behind the creation of that panel is a very complex process in itself, and I'd, I'd like to share a little bit of that with you now. Hmm? Um, so what is it? Well, pedagogical documentation is the way in which we try to enter that dark zone. Hmm? The dark zone of what is happening up here the child knows, but that we have to strive to see and to understand. Hmm? Because for us, this is a process that's not important because it tells us what the child has done. It's a process that is important because it helps us understand how the child is learning. Okay? The pedagogy of relationships is one name for the Reggio Emilia approach. The other one is the pedagogy of listening. And this is at the heart of this. You cannot build a relationship with someone if you cannot open yourself enough to listen to them carefully. Hmm? Listening, and thank you so much <laughs> right now, but listening is one of the most difficult skills the human being strives to acquire. We think we're good at it, and often instead it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to listen to the other. We think we're listening and we're already thinking about what we are going to say next. Hmm? It's easy to listen when you agree with everything that's being said. It's not so easy to feel safe and listen when you don't disagree, when you don't agree, sorry. Hmm? So listening is a very, very difficult skill to acquire through life. 
In Reggio Emilia, we use the word listening as a metaphor. So yes, we are going to strive to listen to the words of the children. So we are listening with our ears. <laughs> but it's also listening with everything else. It's listening in terms of striving to become as close as possible to the child and to the way they are thinking. Hmm? We're trying to tune in, to tune in to um, the thought processes, the learning process of the child, to tune into how the child is feeling, to tune into what is the child trying to communicate to me with their eyes or with their hands. Hmm? Now, if you work with, uh, I don't know, does anybody work here with children under one? <laughs> Not really. Some? No? Two? Okay. Um, well, if you do, you know that their finger speaks a thousand words. But you have to be able to notice it. Hmm? And what you notice will take you right back to the very first thing I spoke about, the image of the child. How you see that child will directly um, affect what you give value to. Hmm? I read about a study done quite a few years back that said something that terrified me. It said, that, I don't know how they do this research, but it said that in classrooms at any given time, in any lesson, only about 7% of the time is given to the teacher really authentically listening to the children. Hmm? Um, because we're always thinking about, no, but we need to do this, we need to do that. Hmm? So we need to be listening, we need to be attentive. This is about creating attention and intention with the children. And of course, it has lots of implications on how you're going to work, because you can't do this if you're sitting alone with 25 kids. Hmm? So, This is what we're striving to do. We believe in Reggio Media that even the youngest child is a bearer of rights. This is very, very important. The child is a bearer of rights. The, the town of Reggio Media has assigned citizenship to everyone from birth, which is quite an interesting concept because normally you, you become a citizen when you're 18. Um, the child strives more than anything to be seen, to be seen, to be understood for who they are, and to be valued. Mm. So, if this is the child, if this is what the child desires, and we believe they are a bearer of rights, then we have a responsibility to create a way of evaluating the child's learning that takes that into account. Hmm? The child wants to be observed, but she doesn't want to be judged. Hmm? And so, in this sense, our assessment is turning everything upside down, and we're not so much thinking about how it will help us know what to do, we're thinking how will this procedure, how will this process help us understand what we are searching for, what we are trying to understand about that child. Hmm? We're not starting from a viewpoint of having a set of criteria to look for, we're not going to measure them against any kind of benchmark. We're not going to set any uh, specific uh, goals that they have to get to for that evaluation. We are striving to make them be seen in 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. So this is what our evaluation process looks like in the final stage. Mm -hmm. 
And it's really, I think, when I think about it, I think it's a very transgressive kind of way to evaluate because it breaks so many rules. We don't evaluate children individually. Uh, we don't measure progress in that sense. And we don't have a set of criteria to follow. What we do want to do is try to show in as objective, but very, very difficult this, but we'll talk about that, in as objective a way as possible, the learning experiences created by the group through each other and try to see each individual child and their place in that group and in that experience. If I show you, as a parent, imagining your parents, if I show you the words only of your child, you gain a very, very partial idea of who your child is. If I show you a transcript of a whole conversation of a group, you understand not only what your child said, you understand what your child listened to, you understand how your child reacted to conversation, you understand how your child builds relationship, you might understand that your child likes to listen more than speak. Hmm? So we do not seek to c concentrate on only the individual child. But this is the very end of the process. Hmm? Um, and as you can see here then, um, we are using the techniques of um, a researcher. Because ultimately what we're doing is a process of research. If we believe, if we hold that image of a child, that the child is a natural born researcher, and that is how they're co-constructing their understanding of their place in the world, the world that it means that child has a right to a teacher who is going to support that research, hmm? who's going to help them take that research forward. And ultimately, that means that it changes the, the role of the teacher, because the teacher then becomes a researcher. OK? So this is a process of research with the child, with the child. And therefore, this documentation process can also be seen as a tool. You know that when we assess, when we evaluate, we need to have tools to do that in order to remain objective. And this is also our research tool for collecting evidence. So the teacher then is no longer teaching. Somebody said this morning, I don't like the word teacher, and I wanted to say me too. <laughs> um, I, I think here, at, with this age group, we have to think of the adult as someone who is first and foremost researching with the child, alongside the child, supporting the child to take their research forward in the group, and also striving to collect as much evidence. You have to know what your own questions are. You know, too many times I go into classrooms where um, when I ask, there's no clear question of what you're trying to find out because we're too connected with what we want to do, what we want to teach. But what are we trying to find out about how children relate to those materials? how children co-construct understanding. So, we're scaffolding. We're, we're, our job is, you know, again, this is Vygotsky. We're taking the child from where they are to where they want to go. We're making that bridge. We're scaffolding them so that they are able to move through that zone of proximal development. Hmm? Um, we're co-constructing with them. We are learners in the classroom with the children. We have to collect that evidence, so we're documenting. 
we're analyzing that documentation. There's no point in spending time collecting evidence if you don't stop and look at it. Huh? And then, of course, we have to interpret it. And we're going to talk about that too. Which then takes us to the word that here is planning, because that's the word I knew you would understand. But what we're talking about here is that process of progettazione. And what is interesting here is that although I've, I've written this here uh, like this, this is not going to be a linear process. You know, because while I am scaffolding, I am documenting and collecting the evidence as I am supporting the learning, you know, and I'm constantly analyzing that as we go through. And so if the teacher is the researcher and this is our research tool. So in order to get to those panels, what we're doing is collecting as much evidence as possible about how the children co-construct their learning together. So here, for example, we have uh, just you know, a sheet off my desk. But um, as you can see, there are children's names at the very top because these are the children in the group. And so what we're doing is each child's column is to show so that I can show, as a child says something, I, can, I know who they said it to. Hmm? The teacher is also um, observing carefully, trying to retrace the steps the children make in the co-construction of what they were doing. So here, for example, they were creating stories through drawing, and so the teacher is retracing the steps of each child in the group, showing the different ways the children construct their process. And also create, writing down their own reflections and what they think might be happening and why they think the child might be doing what they're doing. They're also writing down the voice of the child themselves. What are the children saying? Who are they saying it to? So we're trying to piece together an understanding of not just what's happening in one child's head, but that co-construction, that dynamic that is taking place within the group itself. This pedagogy of relationship. Hmm? So we may be taking photographs. We may be using video. We may be writing our own reflections, writing down what the, the, the children say. And then, of course, we need to take time to look at that and study that and reflect on that. Again, this is another example. And you can see how analytical it can be. When children are, are constructing in 3D, for example, the teacher is attempting to show the different strategies the children have made to construct while they're working together. Mm. Um, up at the top here, she's showing how the children were sitting in the group. You know, because you cannot rely on your own memory for this. And we have to seek to make as, um, as um, objective as possible a representation of what was happening. Mm? This is very, very, very almost dangerous if you're alone. Mm? Um, this is something that you need to do uh, together, and I'll show you that later. Sometimes just photographs themselves work very, very effectively to show exactly that connection that children can make with that environment that they're in, whether it be with the adult, with an object. They're making a connection. Uh, and again, it takes us back to that, you know, that glance that look that the child has, you know? Um, Iman, the philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, is someone whose work is very, very dear to me because he worked a lot on, um, on the face, the concept of the face and the other, and how we can construct our sense of meaning uh, of who we are and why we're here. Um, and, and, and in this photograph, I think, you know, I, I've written this down because I can never remember it, but. Um, if one could possess, grasp, and know the other, it would not be the other. 
And you know, I think this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring the child and the adult together to really understand each other intimately, mm? understand what is happening and the significance of what's happening up there with the child. Because you know, you, you look, you look here, and then you look here. And children, even the youngest, youngest children, make connections all the time. Mm? And it's our job to give value to the connections to take time to stop, to tune in, so that we notice them. Because there is no question about how much children learn <laughs> or what they learn. The bigger question is, do you see it? Hmm? And, and do you value it enough to stop and look for it? Because children are building theory, making connections, and constructing understanding all the time. So, this is the process that we call our evaluation process. And I think the word evaluation is right. Um, and I think that's something you can think about yourself, and you may agree, you may disagree. Um, but I think ultimately it is right uh, because we have to go back and think, what does that word mean? What does the word to evaluate mean? The word to evaluate literally means to give value to. To give value to the child's process, the child's thinking, the child's experience. It gives value to who that child is at this time in their life. We're not worrying about where the child needs to go next. Hmm? We're not worried about, are they ready for school? <laughs> hmm? What we're worrying about is, is this child being seen not only for what he can do, but for what he has inside him, for that potential of what he can do next. And what, how can I help him get there? We're not judging whether or not he's in the right place. And that is one very big, important difference, I think. Mm. It has to be a shared process, because this is subjectivity. <laughs> this is subjectivity, subjectivity as a value, subjectivity as something which enriches our experience. But we all know that subjectivity means it's a partial viewpoint. Mm. In Reggio Emilia, there, are never, there is never a classroom with only one adult. It doesn't matter the number of children, there is never a classroom with one adult. It's not about ratio, it's about intersubjectivity. Because the adult needs another set of eyes to be able to share their understanding with. Mm? So this process has to be shared with the co-teacher in the classroom. That doesn't mean the co-teacher is with the group as well. That means the co-teacher who was not with the group brings a fresh set of eyes to the evidence that you have collected. Okay, so you need to share your evidence with the other adult and you need to ask them, you need to open that heart again and say, look, I need to know what you see. Help me understand. Mm. And so we share the videos, we share the photographs, we share our notes, we share our thinking. And of course, the other side always brings something new to the, to the situation, a new perspective. Because we always enter into any situation, uh, we never go in new, fresh. We always bring something with us, our own past experience. Mm. And it helps us see the child from a different perspective. So we need to make time to sit down, to study, to reflect, and to analyze the evidence. And this takes us to something which I think is very, very interesting, and it's this. This does not happen at the end. Because often when we think about documentation, documentation tends to be something where you collect it, and then at the end you look at it. 
But this is going on every day. This is an ongoing process during the learning. And so in this way, the documentation process actually guides the learning and influences the learning. Hmm? So who then <laughs> is this for? Well, first of all, it's for the children. Hmm? It's for the children. Now, it's for the children, but it's also of the children. The children are often the documenter. The children, even the youngest kids, are involved. The three-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds can be involved in collecting evidence. It's extremely important from the adult perspective to see the world from the child perspective. Give your children the camera and see what happens. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. Very interesting. So it's for the children and of the children. It's for the children because within this ongoing process, we are constantly sharing it back to the child. The next day begins by looking at the evidence. Let's look at these photographs. Do you remember what we were doing yesterday? Would you like to explain why you were doing this? Or what do you think we're going to do next? How can we take this forward? Hmm? Of course, it's for the teachers in the classroom because it helps us do everything we're talking about. It helps us think about the learning. It's something very important it allows us to do. The documentation process gives us a moment of pause. It allows us to stop. It allows us to stop between what has happened and what is going to happen. It allows us to stop and think and reflect. And this asks us to become a very reflective practitioner, a very reflective educator. Um, and it kind of placeholds that. It stops us and gives us that moment of pause to think so that we can decide which direction are we going to take this with the children. Hmm? It's for the families. Now, you know, I didn't do that. I didn't choose these, these uh, symbols. And when the, the PowerPoint kind of threw out the, the sword, and I was like, ooh, sword for family, that's interesting. And I had no idea why. And then I thought, well, I'm coming to Toledo. <laughs> and I'm going to leave it because, you know, Toledo's and knives. And maybe there's a reason why the family symbol is a sword. I have no idea. Um, but it's for families. Because the documentation process has to be shared with the family. Not at the end of the year, not in the portfolio you just hand over to them and say goodbye with, but constantly throughout the experience of the child's life in the school. Something very interesting in Regimen is we very rarely, almost never meet with parents individually. We are a community. We bring families together in their class group to share our thinking and our understanding of how children are learning. Now, from certain parts of the world, people start to panic and they say, oh, what about privacy? You can't do that. But you know, children talk to their parents at home. They tell them things. We don't worry about privacy because we can't have it. Children talk with their parents anyway. And more importantly than that, when you bring families together, they share their own experiences with each other. Again, this is social constructivism. There is no leader here. It's just like in the classroom. It is not your job to be the person who children's questions go through. It is your job to help the children construct their learning together. And it's the exact same process with the parents. So we bring them together. And we share the whole documentation process of a particular project that is happening. And it's wonderful, because the teacher doesn't need to say very much at all. The parents start to ask questions. They start to answer each other's questions. And what we do here is we build a culture of learning in your community. And that's when the school becomes a school, when it becomes a really honest culture of learning. And it's for society, because those final documentation panels make 
your school culture of learning visible to your bigger community. In Regimilia, at certain times in the year, you see these, these panels in shop windows, in the squares, in the theatre, in so many different public places, so that the, the, the town never loses sight of the fact that the school is at the heart of the community. Hmm? Well, I think you're beginning to understand then why, why we do it. So let's just kind of recap a little bit. Well, we're doing it not just to show what the child has done or what they have been able to do. We do it to try to reveal the potential of the child. Hmm? What that child can become. That's very important. We do it to make the child's own voice visible. The, their voice, whether they can speak or not, no matter what language they speak in. And a lot of you are working in international schools where the language, the verbal language, is enriching with more than one language, but also becomes a challenge when children want to share that higher order thinking. So how are we making the thinking visible, giving voice to all the thoughts and the th feelings and the theories in so many different ways. And again, as I said, this is informing the actual direction of the inquiry process during the inquiry process. We're not doing everything and then stopping and looking back and seeing what they did. This is helping you decide where you are going to go next with the children. Hmm? And in that sense, we are evaluating not just the child, but we're evaluating so many other aspects of this. Mm? And it's going back to that image of the child that we, we, we hold. We want to try to reveal everything about the child that we can. Mm? We want to show that the child learns from the other child. Mm? Now, I'm not going to read through all of that, but this is just one not particularly wonderful, just normal example of how children co-construct their understanding. When they're working in this way, they're learning from each other. And really, you know, down here at the very, almost here at the bottom, and it says, um, they're trying to build up sphere about, you know, what is happening with the water, um, where it's coming from, what, why it's doing what it's doing. And um, it's material that can be drunk because water is liquid. Oh, BB. Another child, come over here. You're clever. Tell me something about the water. Why do you think it's light blue? They're four years old. Didn't turn to the teacher. <laughs> hmm? So these things are happening in your classroom all the time. In the construction area, while they're painting, while they're playing outside and you think you don't need to look at that. It's happening all the time. The question is, are you hearing it? Are you seeing it? Are you giving value to it? And it helps us see that the child is learning so much more than what they need to know about the water. He's learning how to co-construct understanding, how to build relationships, how to problem solve. Hmm? If anyone follows uh, Davos and the World Economic Forum, you know, every now and again, the, the um, send out their lists of uh, what are the top 10 skills that we are going to need to be successful in the future. And it's no longer problem solving, it's collaborative problem solving. Mm? It's empathy, service orientation. Uh, it's about being together and constructing the world together. Mm? So this is what these children are doing. Mm? And as I said, this is an ongoing process, and you have to make time to sit and to be together, to study your own documentation, share it with your colleagues, ask their questions, disagree. Hmm? Collaborative planning. Who's in a PYP school? Put up your hand if you have heard that before. Collaborative planning. Yeah. Um, collaborative planning is not about sharing out the tasks. It's not about deciding who's going to do what. Collaborative planning means having a really good discussion, listening to each other, disagreeing, arguing, finally making a decision, collective decision to go ahead together. 
mm, on how we are going to take things forward. So this is what we have to be doing. Uh, and in order to create that objective as possible idea of where the children are and where they are going to go next. Mm. Because what it is, is a partial narrative. And it's not useful unless we share it and we, we discuss it. Mm. Um, it is an interpretation, ultimately, of how you see the child. And obviously, some, a document like that, of course, um, is shared with the family in the, the presentations, but it's also shared with the family through the portfolio of the child. Each individual child has their portfolio. And when we have a piece of group learning like that, a copy of that will go into the portfolio also for the, for the family, for the child as well. Um, and it, of course, we have to inc include the voice of the child, actually the voice, the, the words of the child when they, when they speak, that's very, very important. Mm. Because what we're trying to do is make visible this learning process. Mm. Because it is a responsibility. This is your responsibility. It's too big a responsibility to do alone. Mm? Um, it's a responsibility that has to invo involve your voice, your colleague's voice, the voice of the child, and the voice of the parent. Sometimes we include the voice of the parent in how they see the child as well. And ultimately, I think it's going to change the way you teach. Because, as I said, it, it place holds the learning. It allows you to become a much deeper and more reflective thinker about what is happening and about how you can support the child in the learning. And normally, it asks you to, in the end, you become a teacher who needs to listen to the child before you know what to do next. So we're no longer planning the curriculum before we know who the children are. How can you plan the curriculum for the learning if you don't know what they're interested in? Hmm? So Malaguzzi says, stand aside for a while and leave room for the learning. Observe carefully what children do and then if you have understood well, perhaps the teaching will be different from before. Mm? Children communicate that higher order thinking through metaphor. If you don't seek to make that visible, you will not be able to see it or give value to it. Uh, Children are the most poetic of all human beings. Well, I think the answer to that, is, is, I think, is clear. The answer to what is this relationship, then, between documentation and assessment is that it, it gives value to the child's experience, to who they are at this time in their life, and to all that they can do and all that they could do with your help. The word to assess, the word to assess comes from the Latin, assidere. Hmm? And the word assidere means to sit down alongside. And that's what we ask you to do. To sit down alongside the child, to listen, to tune in, and to connect and to build that relationship with the child. Thank you very much.